Well, good morning, everybody. Today we are going to be talking about what has become known as the Great Commission. Maybe you've heard of that, the Great Commission. It's not called the Great Commission in the Bible, but it was a term coined by somebody in the 16th century, and we know it today as the Great Commission. But before we get there, I want you to hear a friend of mine, Ron Pierce. Ron has actually spoken here. You might remember him. Ron is the um, director, head of Empower Ministries. They're based out of Toronto area. But Empower Ministries resources Christians around the world. And I don't know anybody, I don't know anybody like Ron Pierce who actually knows what God is doing in almost every corner of the globe. I've been with him and I've just, I've thrown out names like Vietnam or, or Laos or, you know, um, just pick a country. And he'll, he'll just start talking about what God is doing there. A tremendous um, encouragement. And uh, I think if you heard him here, You'll know that's true. But I had a telephone conversation with him on Friday. And uh, it was so good that I, wanna, I want you to listen in on part of it. There's two questions that I ask him. Question number one is, Ron, in a world of bad news, is there any good news? And then I'm going to ask him the question, um, what would it look like if Canadian churches took the Great Commission seriously? So let's just listen to this. It's about five minutes, uh, six minutes, but I think it's well worth listening to. Well, let's get started, Ron, and um, Excellent. let me ask you the first uh, question that was on my mind here. And uh, With all the bad news going on in the world right now, um, is there any good news that you're picking up that you're seeing? To be honest with you, Dan, all I'm hearing is good news. Mm-hmm. Um, I realize that COVID is a problem around the world, especially in India and other countries like that. But the reports that I've been getting recently are so positive because so many people are turning to Christ. And in these countries that we work in, the national church is literally experiencing revival within the body of Christ. And wow. therefore, this is the best time since Matthew 28, um, 18 to 20, when Jesus gave us the Great Commission. This is the best time for missions ever. And now we're, we're, we're just seeing multitudes coming to Christ. For instance, um, I just got off the phone two days ago from China, and uh, 10 of the largest house church networks uh, in the country, representing millions and millions of people, uh, gave me this number because they said we've had such a spike in people accepting Christ. They say that right now only uh, uh, 60% of their population of the, in the church has got Bibles. They need 30 to 40 percent of their population need Bibles. They're without. And that amounts to about 40 to 50 million people that are looking for a Bible right now. And I said, oh, it is. It, it's stunning. But I said, so where did all these people come from? He says, recently in the last two years, there's been such a turning to God that these people have come into the body of Christ and they're just searching desperately for a Bible. That's why we're printing as many as we can and as quickly as we can. So these are the times that we were praying for and are now here because the people are are sensing their their fragility, you might say. They are understanding that death is at the doorstep, maybe with COVID and other things like that. And pastors are out there sharing the gospel um, with, in their mind, knowing that the end is near. And therefore, these people are responding. So there's energy right now in the body of Christ. Um, just let me put it to you this way. If you go from Matthew chapter um, 28, verses 16 to 20, and if you turn the pages of you, you're going to come over to Acts chapter 2 verse 42, where it talks about the church of Jesus Christ and in the early days. And in 42, it says this, and they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to bring of bread, and to prayer. And that's the picture of what we're seeing now in the body of Christ around the world. In India, on any given night, in one group there of House Church Network group, 200,000 people are gathering for prayer. They are just Uh, breaking new ground in that country with the numbers that are coming to the Lord. So revival is breaking out in the church, and this is the good news I'm trying to share with people. Well, Ron, that's absolutely fantastic. I mean, you know, we read about this stuff in Acts and in the New Testament, and all of a sudden we're seeing it in our world. I mean, that's tremendously encouraging. Oh, it is. Um, You know, one of the, I guess one of the things, too, that it, it, 
I guess it does to me is it says, Lord, don't don't forget about us here in North America. And uh, I wonder, perspective, Ron, what would it look like uh, in our Canadian churches if we really took the Great Commission seriously? Well, if if we <laughs> if we were infected <laughs> with not with COVID, but if we were infected with the same revival that is breaking out in the Indias, Chinas, Vietnams, Ethiopias of the world, it would look like this. It would look like people would be coming to the church to share their goods with the people that don't have anything. They would be praying for the sick. They would be um, spending hours in prayer, both themselves privately, but also as a group in a church. Even with COVID, they find ways to pray. They would be sitting under teaching. And what I mean by that, there would be new Christians coming in because the church would be so attractive that new believers would be coming in. And pastors like you, Dan, would be teaching all the time to groups of people who would be just like sponges absorbing the Word of God. And they would be growing so quickly. They would be sharing it with their friends and relatives that were unsaved. And there would be a snowball effect. And the, uh, the, the kingdom would be growing overnight not just in number, but in depth. Hmm. And that is a revival leading to an outpouring of the Spirit with so many people coming to Christ. That is the picture we're seeing all around the world right now. And what is sparking this, these good times? It's the COVID. It is the idea that people realize that their religions are not satisfying them and that they're looking for answers because death is at the doorstep. The same thing would be true in Canada. People would say, materialism isn't satisfying me. I'm empty inside. I know I'm a sinner, and I have to find the answer. And when we present an example as Christians of a transformed life, people will come to us and say, what have you got? I want what you have. That's what would be in Canada. Man, that's, that's you know, that's the heart cry, I think, of uh, so many people in Canada right now. And uh, oh, it is. You know, we, Sure, appreciate you, Ron, um, spending some time with us. And uh, at the same time, we really value our relationship with you and Empower Ministries. And uh, you've been able to give us a perspective on uh, so often on what's going on around the world and at the same time encourage us. So, so grateful yeah. for your friendship, Ron. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dan, and thank you, all, all of your church and all our friends out there in Red Deer. Thank you so much for all of your help. You're making a difference. And we're seeing people come to know Jesus. And really, that's all that counts. It's how many people will know Jesus when the end comes. Yeah, that's absolutely right. God bless you. Thank you. Yeah. God bless you. Ron, thank you for this. This is this is that's like, good. This is gold. I mean, this uh, is the, we'll just pray the Holy Spirit stirs our hearts up, you know. Thank you. Take God care, bless. Dan. Yeah. You Bye. too. Bye bye. You know, the most profound story in the 21st century is the explosive growth of the church around the world. Um, it actually should come as no surprise to us to hear stories like this. Because Jesus did say that his church would become a light to the nations. And if you read Matthew 24, he also said that before the end, before Christ comes back, Jesus said, everybody will have heard of the gospel and the good news. The gospel will reach to the ends of the earth, he said, before the end. So it shouldn't surprise us that it's actually growing explosively around the planet today. I want to read you Matthew 28. I think you know it. It's called the Great Commission, but that's where we want to land and think about a few things there today in Matthew chapter 28. About the last words of Jesus, just before he was taken back to heaven, uh, he said to his disciples after he was raised from the dead these words. Well, actually, let me just preface it. The 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's what's known as the Great Commission. Not the Great Suggestion, as sometimes we maybe read it, but actually as the Great Commission. It's for all Christians, not just some. Every Christian uh, should take these words to heart 
as being personally addressed by Jesus Christ. You know, there's two very high points in Scripture. We looked at them both in this series. One is Genesis 12, 1 to 3. That's the original Great Commission, where God says to Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to bless you so you can be a blessing to all nations on earth. That's the first high point in Scripture. And then there's that high point at the end of the Bible in Revelation 7, which is the fulfillment of God's word to Abraham. Every nation, tribe, tongue is worshiping around the throne in Revelation 7. So you have Genesis 12, Revelation 7, and in the middle, in the middle, or in the meantime, you have the Great Commission, where we're told to go and make disciples. Now the Great Commission, I don't know if you know this, has deep, deep Old Testament roots. What's fascinating is, you would think these last words of Jesus um, would be grabbed on by the disciples, and they would never let them go, uh, but if you read through the book of Acts and the letters of Paul and Peter and others, they don't reference it. You'll find really no reference to the Great Commission uh, in Acts or in all of the rest of the New Testament. Why is that? Well, it's that way because the Great Commission wouldn't have been new to them. It was something they already knew. They knew the Old Testament well. And they wouldn't be surprised because the Great Commission is a summary of what's already been highlighted in the Old Testament. For example, in Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 10, you read these words. Um, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I've chosen, so that you'll know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor will the one after me. And then you could um, just turn over a few pages to Isaiah 49, and you'd come down to verse 6, and you'd read these words. Um, it's too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I've kept. I'll also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. See, Jesus is just picking up the words of Isaiah, that we'll be his witnesses, and actually to the ends of the earth, and he's running a highlighter through it for his disciples. They would have known this. That's why you never read about it, really, in Acts. And so on. They, they assumed that. They knew that. It was already part of their DNA. Uh, so what's new about the Great Commission? Well, what's new about it would be this. Up until this point in the Old Testament, uh, everybody was looked at as coming to Jerusalem. Um, Micah, or is it, yes, yeah, Micah chapter 5, talks about the mountain of the Lord being raised up and the nation streaming to it. The idea was that the people would come to Jerusalem and they would learn. The Great Commission now reverses that and disperses the followers of Jesus out, out into all the world to the ends of the earth to the end of ages. So that's the way the Great Commission actually works. It just turns it inside out in a way, something they already know. But now Jesus says, instead of people coming to you, you're to go to them. That's the way the Great Commission would work. Now, it's important to understand this, that it wasn't as though Jesus said, oh, just a minute, I forgot something. Or just before we went back to heaven, he said, you know, I almost forgot to tell you, go into all the world. Not that at all. It's not an afterthought, but rather, just as I said, a concise summary of what the Old Testament has been saying all along. The, the Great Commission is hugely important on the pages of Scripture. Hugely important. Um, basically, Jesus is saying to take the good news every, from everywhere to everywhere. That's a good way to look at it. Take the good news from everywhere to everywhere. So what I'd like to do for a few minutes with you uh, as we think about the Great Commission is I, I, want to, um, I want to think of three things that are necessary if we're going to obey this command properly. So here they are. Here's the first thing. Uh, I, I think we need to consider who it is that issues the command who is it that issues the command to go into all the world and make disciples, baptize them, teach them to obey everything? Who is it? Well, you say it's Jesus, and you'd be right. Who is Jesus? He's the one here that says all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. It's the CEO of the universe that says these words. There's no higher authority than Jesus. All authority, whether it's in heaven or it's on earth, has now been put in the hands of Jesus Christ. He's literally the CEO of the universe, and he's the one that issues the command to us. The word authority is a really important word. I know it's an unpopular word in our culture, in our world today. It smacks in our world of oppression, tyranny, um, dictatorship. 
And we see strong movements to oppose authority from defunding police to riots to whatever. But the word authority in the New Testament basically has two ideas wrapped up in it. And I want to tell you what they are. One is the right to do something. Somebody with authority has the right to do something. Then the second idea in there, uh, the word authority, is the power and ability to do what one has the right to do. So the right to do something and the power and ability to do what one has the right to do. Only when those two come together do you have real authority. Um, some people have the right, but they lack the power. Other people have power, but they lack le legitimacy or the right to do it. But in Jesus, both come together, the right and the power to do. Now, that was, that was one of the most remarkable things about Jesus when people listened to him, followed him around. He, time and time again in the New Testament, you'll read, they marveled at his authority. Do you remember when he finished the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, 7? You know what it says there? I'll read it to you. It says, the, the, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. That was one of the most remarkable things about Jesus that people picked out right away. This man has authority. He has power and apparently has the right. And he would demonstrate that time and time again. So Jesus is, is the one that issues the command. The one who has all authority has been given to him. And he says, now go. Or another way of putting that would be, now move. I have all authority, now move out. Or another way, which is a little more powerful, which should be true to the text, all authority has been given to me, so get moving. Don't sit there. Get moving. That's what Jesus is saying. So we have to consider who it is that issues the command. Second thing I think that's vitally important is that we count the cost. We count the cost. I, I think you know this, but it costs something to follow Jesus. It really does. Um, you know, salvation is free, it's a gift, and yet it costs you everything. Sometimes we don't count the cost. I mean, what's it going to cost you to obey this command? Well, you might be embarrassed to have to stand up for Jesus. You might be left out. Some people are persecuted. Some people have to give up their possessions or their comfort. Um, for sure, it's not safe and it's not comfortable to follow Jesus. It's not you know, we say the dumbest things thinking they're in the Bible. You ever heard somebody say the safest thing is to be in the center of God's will? Where would you ever find that in the Bible? Try flying that past Paul. Paul was in the very center of God's will. He was beaten, whipped, tortured, eventually died for his faith right in the center of God's. It is not comfortable to follow Jesus because maybe like the rich young ruler, he'll come to you and say, you know what, you gotta give up everything you have and follow me. It's not safe to follow Jesus because he's gonna push you out places you would rather not go. So that's why Jesus is always, when he's looking at the huge crowds following him, he's saying, wait a minute, before you come after me, you better count the cost. You remember those remarkable words, I think it's the end of Mark chapter eight. Um, if I can find them, I'll read them to you. Well, here it is. Jesus said, if anyone, circle the word anyone, if anyone would come after me, they must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. How safe is that? Whoever wants to save his life, follow me, could lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a person to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a person give in exchange for their soul? But if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, that would be our generation, wouldn't it? Can you find two better words to describe this generation? Sinful and adulterous generation. If you're ashamed of me, the Son of Man will be ashamed of you when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. So clearly... We're being asked, like the rich young ruler was asked, to count the cost before we get up and follow Jesus. Um, the people in Matthew 28 that take the Great Commission seriously have considered who it is that issues the command, and they've counted the cost. But think, not just of the cost, flip that over and think of what it will be like one day when you're gathered with that crowd around the throne depicted in Revelation chapter 7. From every nation, tribe, tongue, they're all there. They're worshiping, singing like you've never heard in your life. That will be, mark this down, 
That will be the very best day of your life. Very best day of your life. Now, use your imagination. I talked to you about this before. I wish Christians knew how to use their imagination more. The enemy knows how to use it or get you to use it. But the Holy Spirit, I think, wants us to use it too. Imagine what it will be like to be part of that crowd. You're there. The end has come. We're there. Imagine that. You're standing with that massive throng, and you cannot believe the worship. You cannot... You, you can't even express from your own heart all the worships that there. And you, and you see Jesus, man of joy at the center of the crowd, and he's just, you've never seen any person filled with joy like Jesus. Because for the joy set before him on that day, he endured the cross. And just for whatever reason, for one minute, imagine you took your eyes off of Jesus and you just scanned the crowd. Imagine what it would be like. There's my kids. There's my grandkids, and they're all worshiping. And you know why? Because I wasn't embarrassed about Jesus. And I told them the word of God and worshiping Jesus and following him was more important than sports or money or anything else. And they allowed themselves to be shaped and formed by this book, and they're there worshiping. You'll never regret one moment you ever, you ever prayed for them, taught them the way of the Lord, brought them maybe kicking and screaming to the fellowship of God's people. And your eyes move around a bit, and there, oh my goodness, there's your neighbor. It was so hard to go across the street and open up the relationship. You felt awkward, didn't know how you'd be received, but you began a relationship. And eventually, your neighbor came to Christ. They're part of the crowd because you were faithful. They're there. And you, you keep looking, and you Oh, I cannot believe it. There's a young mom with a baby and she's dancing and jumping and filled with joy. And then you remember, that's, that's the person I served, the pregnancy care center. Built a relationship with, loved her. She walked into the arms of Jesus. You keep looking, and there's a whole pile of Ethiopians over there, right over there. They're all dressed in their cultural stuff and they're worshiping Jesus with all their hearts. And you remember that day when Ron Pierce said they didn't have Bibles and, and Tracy had brought that up and we talked about our missions budget. And you didn't have a lot of money. You only had $10, but you put it in. Jesus took it and multiplied it like the loaves and fishes and supplied Bibles to Ethiopian pastors and they took them into villages. And some of those people there, they're from those villages. And you gave. It's, it's so hard to know where to look because there's Jesus, but look at all, there's Syrians over there. We called them Syrian refugees. But now, they're called children of the Most High God. And they're worshiping. Do you remember how you, you only had four weeks holidays. But you gave up two of them. You went to Porto Astro in Greece. You served at the family camp. You couldn't even the refugee family camp, Syrian refugee family camp. You couldn't speak the language, but you loved them. You smiled, you prayed for them, and you served them in Jesus' name, and some of them were right there. What would it be like to be there and to look around and see nobody that had any connection to you? All the investment of Jesus Christ in your life all the gifts he gave you, the open doors. And you said, you know what? I just want to live my Christian thing out quietly. I just want to do my own thing. I, you know, I, I might need my money, so I, you know, it's COVID and jobs. Are necessary. I don't want to give any money to the line. I'm going to keep it. But somehow you get there and you're saved, but you look around and there's nobody there that you can say, that was a person. I took the good news to. There's somebody that I discipled. There's people that are here because I gave to the work of the Lord there. See, when you count the cost, think about both sides of it. Think about today, but think about the best day of your life when you'll be there around the throne. Consider who issues the command, count the cost, and then commit yourself to God's mission. Commit yourself to God's mission. This is his mission. We are people with a mission. Now, I, you know, I, some people say, well, I, it, it just seems like God's mission is so small. Listen, it's huge. It's, it's, um, 
It's expansive. Can I show you the pieces that go together to make God's mission? Let, look at them for a minute on the screen. Here, I'm gonna give you five marks of God's mission. Here they are. Evangelism and teaching, clearly there in the Great Commission. Compassion, justice, creation care. You say, well, where's that in the Great Commission? Right at the heart of it. Read it again. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Everything. Does that, that includes evangelism and teaching and compassion. Helping out those that are, are hungry and are naked and are sick. And, and justice, reforming structures in society that need to be reformed. And creation care, it's all there. It would be so easy for me to get off on creation care. I did a whole series on it. Um, because I, I, and I emphasize it because it's the one we most forget. But you know, Genesis 1 and 2 and Revelation 21 and 22, first two chapters in the Bible, last two chapters in the Bible, it's about creation. It's about creation. In Genesis chapter 1 and 3, uh, 1 and 2 rather, where God creates the heavens and the earth and people, there's three primary relationships that people have. One is to their creator, God. The other relationship is to each other. And the third relationship is to their uh, to the creation, to the earth. All three, creation, all three relationships are vitally important. Um, all three were impacted tragically by the fall when Adam and Eve fell into sin and we, like sheep, um, went astray too. All three were impacted. And God calls us now back to relationship with himself, to one another, and to a proper relationship with his creation. What's a proper relationship with the creation? Well, it's to avoid deifying the creation, like some people do. It's to avoid exploiting it. It is actually to cooperate with the creator in using its resources for the good of all and uh, sustaining the environment and all those kinds of things. Um, I, I want to read you a quote from Chris Wright, a great writer, somebody I really like. Uh, I've learned a lot from him. Chris Wright says, it seems quite inexplicable to me that to some Christians who claim to love and worship God, to be disciples actually of Jesus, and yet have no concern for the earth that bears his stamp of ownership. They don't care about the abuse of the earth, and indeed by their wasteful and over-consumptive lifestyles, they contribute to it. And he ends by saying, God intends our care of the creation to reflect our love for the creator. I bring those five up to tell you that there is a place for everybody to participate in God's great mission. There is. One of those places has your name on it. God's given you passions and gifts, and he calls you to go. In the words of the Great Commission, let's get moving. All authority's been given to me. Let's get moving into these areas. Now, let me walk you carefully for just, just five minutes or so, maybe, maybe seven, uh, through the Great Commission, so you understand exactly what he's saying. He says, move out and make disciples. What are disciples? The, the heart of the word disciple, here's what it is. Don't miss this. A disciple is somebody attached to Jesus, closely connected to Jesus. That's a disciple. Come follow me, Jesus said. They were attached to Jesus. A disciple isn't somebody who sits in a classroom and learns stuff. A disciple is somebody who steps out and follows Jesus and allows their life to be formed and shaped by the life and teachings of Jesus. They're closely attached to Jesus, disciple. Go and make disciples. Don't, make sure you know what it, it doesn't say. It doesn't say go and make Christians. It doesn't say go and make missionaries. It doesn't say go and make leaders. It doesn't say go and make people who pray a prayer. It says go and make disciples. So many people rely on the fact that somewhere back there I prayed a prayer. I'm not sure that saves you at all. I know people that say, well, you know, he, she's not living that great a life, but she prayed a prayer. Or, you know, he, he was a good guy. I mean, he got a little off track, but I know somewhere back there he prayed a prayer. Where do you find that in the Bible that that's good enough? Go and make disciples, people who are closely attached to Jesus and live out their faith in relationship with him. And then it says baptize them. When you're baptized... There, um, there are two gifts that God gives you. Here's they are. Here's they are. Number one, you, you take on God's name and you become part of his family. Um, 
you become now his treasured possession, the most treasured possession of the triune God. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You know, you're part of the family. You take on his name. You're gifted with that. Then you're gifted with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was baptized, the Spirit came down. Um, you'll find, you, you read the accounts of baptism in the New Testament, and it's really hard to separate the Spirit and baptism. Um, the Holy Spirit, one, one of the reasons some of you uh, cannot make the Christian life work is you're trying to do it without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. You've never been baptized. And you don't have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. No wonder it doesn't work. Make, peop, make disciples, people who are closely attached to Jesus, and baptize them. Is baptism necessary for salvation? Ordinarily, yes. How else could you answer that question from the pages of the New Testament, from the book of Acts? Is baptism necessary for salvation? Ordinarily, yes. Is baptism necessary for salvation? Extraordinarily, no. As in the example of the thief on the cross, you couldn't be baptized. God is well able to save without baptism, but that's extraordinary not ordinary. Um, so baptize them. Disciples, baptize them and then teach them to obey absolutely everything I've commanded you. You can't pick and choose with the words of Jesus. He's the CEO of the universe. Your whole life comes under his lordship. Your money, your relationships, your future, your sexuality, everything is defined by Jesus now. So when we say, come and join us at Crossroads Church and follow Jesus, you know, it, it, the love of God, I've said this so many times, is inclusive. It's inclusive, but it's obedient. So you join us now as we all work together to read the scriptures, to learn them, to help each other grow in the way of the Lord. And when we're baptized, that's the line in the sand. Baptism is the line in the sand that says, I'm now a follower of Jesus Christ, and he calls the shots. And it will always be counterculture against the flow. And it'll cost you. But the best is yet to come. And then what does he say? Well, um, well, let me just actually quote Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Great little book called The Cost of Discipleship. Uh, I think along with Pilgrim's Progress, uh, every Christian should read The Cost of Discipleship. But he says, only the person who believes, only he who believes is obedient and only he who is obedient believes. Isn't that great? Let me read that again. Only he who believes is obedient. And only he who is obedient believes. In other words, don't say you're obedient, follower of Jesus. If you, you know, don't say you're a believer if you're not obedient, is what I'm trying to say. Obedience is the mark of a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's the heart desire to put his teachings into practice in our life. So let me uh, summarize it by saying that um, we mustn't treat these words, as I said, as the great suggestion, but rather as the great commission. It, it's an absolute command. Now move out. Make disciples is the best summary of our job description as Christians, whether we're teachers, graphic designers, carpenters, mothers, grandparents, worship leaders. The, our job description is to make disciples, people who are closely attached to Jesus Christ. So where do we start? Where do we start? Well, I think you need to take these words, uh, the Great Commission, and you need, them to lay, uh, need to lay them alongside Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Let me read it to you. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Where do we start? Well, he, these, these words, Judea, um, or Jerusalem, rather, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth, they're, they're expanding circles. First of all, Jerusalem, you could perhaps look at that as the home front. That's where you start, making disciples. And then Judea, maybe that would be our workplace, our city, our schools. Maybe it would be helping out at places like the Mustard Seed or the Dream Center or the Pregnancy Care Center, places like that. And what if Samaria was, you know, getting into another culture, um, maybe not overseas, but right here, getting to know people that were new, that maybe didn't speak the language well. And what, and of course, the, the ends of the earth and the Great Commission would be, um, mean that we're world Christians. We have to be world Christians. 
We can't just be Christians in Red Deer. We have to be world Christians. That's what Jesus asked us to do. So where do we start? Well, let me, let me just say, Jerusalem, start at home. Start at home. Start on the home front. Um, maybe you're single. Um, well, I'll start with the two or three friends in your life. Who are the two, three, two or three people in your life that you're investing in? Two or three people in your life that you're making disciples of? Are they neighbors or workmates or whatever? Friends? Who are the two or three people? Um, if you're a parent, you start with your children. You, uh, you pray that they'll be shaped and formed by the life and words of Jesus. You start with your children. You teach them that the word of God and the worship of God is the most important thing in life. And you make the, 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 the worship of God with God's people a priority, not an afterthought. You reap what you sow. You sow an athlete, you get an athlete. You sow a man or woman of God, you get a man or woman of God. So you start at home. And then if you're a grandparent, then you carry on, you keep going with your grandchildren. Um, that's job number one. Make disciples of your grandchildren. How do you do that? Well, you see, every opportunity is a disciple-making opportunity, and you pray ahead of time. You say, Father, let me give you an example. Friday nights, we get Kingston. He's my little grandson. And um, he's just in grade one. So Friday nights, I pray, Father, um, I pray, I pray fr you would open opportunities for me to disciple him. And please make me aware of those opportunities. So he's, we're having supper Friday night, and we're sitting at the table, and we say, what's the agenda tonight, Kingston? He holds up this little plastic bag, and it has money in it. And he says, I want to go to Walmart. Like, of all the places I would take him, he wants to go to Walmart. And I want to buy uh, some creature called, um, oh, he's just gone right out of my head, some strange creature, a stuffy. And it's at Walmart, and I know where it is. Okay, we'll go to Walmart. We get to Walmart, and we find this dude, um, and we're walking through Walmart, and we get up to the cash register, and it, it happens every single time. He doesn't have enough money. <laughs> and I have to add to his plastic bag, and we buy this creature, and um, we're walking out. We get to the car. He says, hey, before we go to Tim Hortons, oh, <laughs> okay, before we go to Tim Hortons, can we go to your office? I want to see your fish. We, I have an aquarium of cichlids. I want to see them again. Yeah, we can do that. So we get to the office, and we're sitting in there, and he's feeding the fish and watching them. And, and he says, hey, that one there, it has a black line under its eye. I thought, there's the opportunity. I said, Kingston. Guess what? Did you know that God paints every fish different? Look at them all. They're all painted different. He's looking at them. I said, oh, by the way, you ever notice how many birds are different? God paints birds all different colors. And he just sits there and he goes, oh, hmm, interesting. And I said, thank you, Father. That little kid, he already knows that God made the birds and the fish. He knows God created the heavens and the earth, and all we're doing is just watering a seed. Don't miss, you know, that's how you make disciples, it's just step on step. Uh, you know, you just, you just take whatever open door is there, but you're going into it knowing that God will open a door. That's how you go into it. Where do you start making disciples? Right at home. Right with your close circle of friends. Because on the last day, which will be your best day, you sure want to see them as part of that crowd around the throne. So, consider who issues the command. Count the cost. And let's commit ourselves to make people who are closely attached to Jesus in our families, our neighborhoods, Red Deer, Central Alberta, and to the ends of the earth. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together and pray. Father in heaven, I thank you that um, your word isn't confusing. I mean, there's some parts of it we don't understand, but the parts that we do understand, uh, they scare us because often we're not obedient. Father, I pray that you would help us today to take these words to heart, that we would take seriously 
the Lord Jesus Christ who took us seriously, who shed his blood on the cross for us, who has poured into our lives day after day, grace upon grace. And I pray as we go out this week that we would go out as your servants, obedient to you to make disciples. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.